Risen Lord, live in us that we may live in you. We gather to thank you that in your resurrection we are renewed and transformed. Like a butterfly, we unfold and fly free. Free from the cocoon, free from all the grave clothes that have bound us, our prejudices, our fears, our angers, our self-centeredness, our loneliness. We thank you that in your resurrection, we ourselves may hope for the end of pain, grief, tears, weakness, and for everlasting life in the beauty of your spirit. Alleluia, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
As we enter into our time of prayer, let us pause and reflect on the blessings that we have been given and give thanks for the offerings that we have been blessed to receive. Pastor Peter, will you lead us in prayer? ກົງສົມເລືອກສາສານໍາກາງປ້ອງ Chowmok Father, every time we come into your presence, we recognize that you fill our life with happiness, strength, and goodness. For this reason, we come before you because you have given yourselves to us. Gracious Father, to know that we are sure given an account of ourselves into the Lord, into you, Lord. Inspire us to give our money as well as our very selves as we have been instructed to do. May you bless the gifts and the givers for your glory, we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And Lord, we come to you today with great thanks. Great thanks for the blessings that we have been given. Thanks for the opportunities to give back. But most of all, we give you thanks for your presence in our lives. We give you thanks for the water of life that you quench our thirst with. We give you thanks for the spirit of life that fills us with our very breath. Lord, it is in these nurturing ways that you help us to grow. Lord, we know that without you, we are like dead branches on a tree withering away. But with you, we are alive. We are full of potential. We are green like the leaves and are able to bear glorious fruit in your name. Amen. So God, today we ask for one simple thing. We ask that you nourish us. We ask that you fill us with your life so that we might go forth and spread the fruits of your spirit. That we might be loving, kind, Gentle, peaceful. That we might have control over ourselves so that we can best serve your world. Amen. Because we go out into a world that is so desperately in need of nourishment. In need of new life. In need of reconciliation in need of peace. So Lord, let our life, our nourishment, be a testament to others. And may whatever we do, we do in the glory of your name. Amen. In this we pray, and in the name of Jesus we pray. And now we ask, Lord, that you hear the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thinking of me, I love thee. 
Book of John, chapter 1. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. May God bless the reading of this word this morning and the message to our ears. Amen. Dear God, thank you again for the opportunity that we have to worship you. You are the one who provides for us everything that we need, Lord, in this life. Sometimes we face struggles of many kinds, but we thank you that you are with us. Dear God, we thank you that you provide us with salvation, Lord, a connection to you. And Lord, not only that, but you provide us with growth, the opportunity to answer the call to become who it is that you want us to be. Thank you, God, for the opportunity we have to serve you and to reflect on that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Lately, I've been referring to the gospel as God's story, God's interaction with human beings throughout history. We started by talking about the creation, how God created human beings in his own image, in perfect relationship with God. But of course, we know that our world is far from perfect. And so we also talked about how there was a fall Humanity fell from their relationship with God, turned their backs on God, effectively letting go of the hand of God. But God loves people so much that he didn't leave things that way. He came to us. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, who walked among us, who taught, who showed us the way, who died on the cross for us, and on the third day rose again. Well, the gospel does not end there. The gospel is not just God's story. That's an important part of the whole situation. But it's not just God's story. It's also your story. You see, God is reaching out to you with his hand. The question is, will you grab on to the hand of God? That's what we talked about last week. There comes a time in all of our lives when we must decide what to do with the gospel. It's a moment of decision. Perhaps you have already made that decision. Perhaps you have believed in Jesus Christ. You have trusted in Christ. Perhaps you've gotten baptized. Maybe you're ready to get baptized and you've just decided to do it. You just haven't done it yet. Maybe you've joined a local church. Maybe this church. Or maybe you're ready to do that. But what comes next besides all of that? What happens after you grab on to the hand of God? Or is that all there is to it? You know, 
I believe that Jesus Christ meets people right where they are at. And I believe that's very important. Why? Because we all make bad decisions. We all have sin in our lives that separates us from God. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter how much sin is in your life. Because you know what? Romans 3.23 says that all, all people have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many people is that again? Is it just drug dealers? No. Is it just criminals in prison? No. Is it just teenagers? Is it just parents? No, it's everybody. You see, all people have this problem with sin that separates them from God. But the good news is that Jesus died for the sins of all people. But what happens when a drug dealer believes in Jesus, gets baptized, joins a local church? Does God want them to keep dealing drugs? What happens when a criminal believes in Jesus? Is God okay with them continuing to live the life of a criminal? Absolutely not. You see, God comes down, meets us in the gutter of life, and he reaches his hand out to us so that we will take on to that hand, but that does not mean that he will leave us there. God wants to lift us up. Amen? God wants us to grow. God wants to lift us up. And that is the fifth and final part of our gospel illustration. It is an idea called sanctification, that God helps us to grow over the course of our lives. God meets us, yes, perhaps in the gutter, perhaps at our worst, but he wants us to grow throughout the course of our lives. Not only that, but God helps us to grow. Well, just like the last four weeks, we have two wonderful volunteers today. We have Lily and Claire uh, who have joined us and uh, they're going to help us to represent this idea of God helping us to grow through paint. And so without further ado, let's get our hands dirty one final time. One of them will use her hand to represent the hand of God, uh, placing it way up high on the canvas. The second one of them will use her hand to represent the hand of humanity, placing it also way up high on the canvas. These hands will be touching. They will be connected to symbolize the connection that we have with the Lord once we have trusted in Jesus Christ. The purpose here is to symbolize the idea of being a child of God and growing in your faith over the course of your life. You see, the way that you grab onto God's hand is at the moment of salvation, when you repent and believe in Jesus Christ. We talked about that last time. God meets you wherever you are at, even if it's at your absolute worst. But God loves you too much to leave you there. God loves you so much, he has a plan for your life, wants you to grow in your faith. That is why in our painting today, the hands are still touching, but they're way up high in the painting. So over the course of your entire life, the idea is that you will grow. God takes us, he meets us where we are at, and over the course of our lives, he helps us to become the people that he wants us to be. John the Apostle put it this way in John chapter 1, verse 12. He says, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. God makes many promises to those who grab onto his hand, to those who start a relationship with God. And one of those is to give them the right to be called children of God. That brings us to the fifth and final point of God's story, your story, which is that when people believe in Jesus, they become children of God with purpose. When people believe in Jesus, they become children of God with purpose. What does it mean to become a child of God? Well, in theological terms, it means that God sanctifies us. Now, that's one of those church words, and you may be wondering, what on earth does that mean? Well, I think it's an important word, so I want to define it. What is sanctification? 
the Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology has a good definition, and here's what it says. It is the state of proper functioning. To sanctify someone or something is to set that person or thing apart for the use intended by its designer. A pen is sanctified when used to write. Eyeglasses are sanctified when used to improve eyesight. In the theological sense, things are sanctified when they are used for the purpose God intends. A human being is sanctified, therefore, when he or she lives according to God's design and purpose. So sanctification is a fancy way of saying that you're set apart, that God sets apart his children for a very special purpose. It also means that God makes you holy. There are at least five things that I want to talk about that relate to this idea. Five ways in which God initially sanctifies or sets apart his children for their intended purpose at the moment they believe in him, even if that happened when they were at the lowest point in their life. The first thing that God promises to those who begin in faith is forgiveness. Forgiveness is huge. Forgiveness is so important. Immediately, when you believe in Jesus for the very first time, God forgives all of your sins, all the bad things that you have ever done, whatever they may be. The Bible says this about you as God's child in Romans 8.1. And listen, this is powerful. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Not only that, but even when you sin, even when you make mistakes after coming to faith in Christ, even then God offers you forgiveness. I wonder if there's anybody listening today who feels guilty about something in your past. You've perhaps made a bad decision. And then people made you feel bad about that decision, even though you tried to make up for it. Do you realize that no matter what happens around you, no matter what other people say, that God stands ready to forgive you, no matter what you have done. That's the beauty of God's promise to his people, actually, in 1 John 1, 9, which says this, If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That is such good news. The very first thing, again, that God promises to his children is this, forgiveness. The second thing that God promises to his children is new life, new life. According to Romans 6, verse 4, we, that is Christian believers, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Immediately when you believe, God actually enters your life, enabling you to experience eternal, abundant life in the present, just like God intended from the very beginning when God created people in perfect relationship with himself. It's so important. This is why I compare the gospel to the idea of taking God's hand. You see, salvation is not just about getting a free ticket to heaven. You don't have to wait until you die to have a relationship with God. Absolutely not. New life in Christ is having a relationship with God now, walking with the Lord now in your daily life. It's realizing that you are never truly alone. Why? Because God is with you even right now. The third thing that God promises to his children is new community. This one is so important. I love this one. Uh, New community. Immediately, again, right away, when you believe in Jesus Christ, God makes you a member of a new community. God's family throughout the world. What's the word for that? Well, it's church. Capital C, church. The church around the entire globe. The Bible refers to this as being in Christ. In the book of Romans, the apostle Paul presumes that every single human being is part of one community or another. They are either in Adam or in Christ. They are either part of Adam's community 
or Christ's community. To be in Adam is the situation of the fall. It's a situation of separation between human beings and God. It is a difficult situation. It is a situation that we all at one point lived or are still living. In Romans 5, verse 12, the Apostle Paul describes it this way, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men and women, boys and girls, because all have sinned. Remember, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But, he says in verse 15, the free gift is not like the trespass or the sin. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So Paul is saying that sin and death came about in our world because of Adam, the first human being. Now listen, if you are a believer now, before you were in Christ, you were in Adam. Your old community was the in Adam community. Your old community was completely and utterly separated from God. That's the difficult situation. That's the bad news. But the good news is that the moment you believe in Jesus, God gives you a new community. God gives you this family called the church. You Come together with others in your life who follow Jesus as well. It is a good place to be. This is why in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, it says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. You know, I believe that as human beings who live in a fallen world, we really long for this sort of new community. It's something that we need. We were built for community. Many of us yearn to leave the old behind and to move toward the new community. Back when I was a youth pastor, we would once in a while have a very frank conversation with our students. We used um, something called a decision card and we would be discreet about it, but to kind of figure out where our students were spiritually. Did they have a relationship with the Lord? Did they want to learn more about what it meant to follow Jesus? And so we would, um, in this particular church that I used to serve, most of our students were outreach kids. They were not kids that had grown up in the church. They came from the neighborhood. And so um, on these cards, there was a question about, have you believed in Jesus? And, and do you want to get baptized? Or have you gotten baptized? And of course, there was also the question about, Membership, would you like to join the church? And I think that the funny thing was that there were several kids that would check that they were ready to join the church. And I always thought that was funny because you wouldn't think that teenagers or that kids would want to join a church, but they did. But the funny thing was that a lot of those kids hadn't even been baptized, they hadn't even yet believed in Jesus, but they sensed this need for community. You see, human beings, we're built for that. We're built to be in community. That's why we're struggling so much these days because we can't get together with friends and family like we used to in the past. Community is so important. We need it. That's why what we do as a church is so important. That's why bringing people together, even if it's in a parking lot as we did this morning, that's why bringing people together online through Facebook and YouTube is so important because we have tasted this new community, this family of God, and it is so vitally important to our lives. Well, the fourth thing that God promises to his children is a new mission, new mission. Again, immediately, right away, when you believe in Jesus, when you connect with Christ, God gives you a new mission in life. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5.18, that all of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. 
We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. My friends, just as you have been reconciled to God, God wants to use you to reconcile other people to himself. God wants to use you to share this message of hope with others. Do you realize, by the way, that you have an opportunity to do that every single week? You have an opportunity to do that right now in this minute. While you are watching this stream, while you are listening to it, you could share it with a friend. You could think about that person in your life who you know is going through a hard time, who could use a little hope, who could use a little encouragement, and you can click share on your stream and your social media feed. It's part of this new mission that we have, and that is to share the hope of Jesus Christ with the people in our lives. So important, especially these days. The point is that as God's child, you have a purpose. I want you to hear that. You have a purpose in life. You have a mission. God promises this to all of his children. The fifth thing that God promises to his kids is a new destination. This is the idea that after you die, you will experience eternal, abundant life in the presence of God forever. In other words, you'll go to heaven one day when you die. This is, of course, one of the most important things about grabbing on to God's hand. And even more important is the fact that God will never let you go. Here's what Jesus says about God's children in John 10, 28. Write this one down, memorize this one, remember it. John 10, 28. Here's what Jesus said about the children of God. I give them eternal life. Amen? I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one, no one can snatch them from my hand. This is also why I use the illustration of the hands. Because God loves you so much. He wants to connect with you not just once, but throughout the course of your life and really throughout all eternity. Nothing, nothing, once you have done that, can separate you from God. Not even death, not even the devil himself. These are all ways that God sets apart or sanctifies us when we believe in Jesus. But what else did sanctification mean? I alluded to another part of it, and that was to make holy. So what does that mean? How does God make us holy? Well, there is initial sanctification, and that's the idea of God setting us apart for those five different purposes we just talked about. But there's also the idea of progressive sanctification, the idea that God meets you where you're at but helps you to grow throughout the course of your life. It's the idea of growing in your faith, a lifelong, spirit-empowered process. In John 14, 16, as Jesus was preparing his disciples for his physical departure, here's what he said. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus was telling his disciples that they would, number one, be indwelt by God the Holy Spirit, who would be their helper, who would help them to live holy lives and ultimately empower their new community, the church, to grow spiritually and numerically. Secondly, lives lived in the Spirit should yield fruit over time. We're talking about growing, right? A plant grows, right? It grows up from the ground. But not only that, eventually it bears fruit. In fact, Galatians 5, through 23, refers to this process as bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Attitudes and actions that reflect love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But if someone is being sanctified in this way, if they are being made holy, doesn't that mean that they would never sin? What happens if I mess up? What if I do sin? Does that mean that I'm not saved anymore? Absolutely not. 
You see, God doesn't just sanctify us one time at the moment that we believe in Jesus, but also over the course of our entire lives. God, the Holy Spirit, is always progressively helping us to be holy, to grow in our faith, to become more and more like Jesus every day. It's a process that won't end until we meet Jesus face to face. It's sort of like education. I don't know how many of you are in the situation where you have kids or grandkids in your home that these days are going to school, guess what, in your home, right? I have four of them. I have a, a kindergartner, and I have a middle school student and a high school student, and they're all involved in school. That's only three because the fourth is actually an infant, and she's just kind of hanging out at home and, uh, and learning in her own way. Uh, but just as a student, as one of my kids or one of yours or one of your grandkids, as, just as they spend 13 long years, think about that, 13 years in school, kindergarten, grade school, middle school, high school, just like that, as they prepare for graduation day, the children of God spend their entire lives being transformed to be like Christ by the Holy Spirit, growing in faith the whole time. There's a really cool verse, by the way, that speaks to this idea. 1 John 3, 1 and 2. Here's what it says. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And we will be, and what we will be, has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, when Jesus appears, we shall be like him. We shall be like him, brothers and sisters, for we shall see him as he is. Just imagine what this is saying. It's amazing. First of all, it's saying that once you have grabbed onto God's hand, you're called a child of God. That in and of itself is a really big deal. I wonder if you're listening to me today. Do you ever struggle with issues of sadness, issues of depression, issues related to your self-esteem, caught up in regrets over your past, thinking you're not good enough at your job, thinking you're not popular enough, thinking that you simply don't stack up? Well, this verse says, think again. This verse says that if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a dearly loved child of God Almighty, the creator of the whole universe. And that is way more important than anything anybody in this world could ever tell you. Not only that, but this passage is also saying that one day, number three, we shall be like him. We shall be like Jesus for we shall see him as he is. That means that no matter how imperfect we think we are now, no matter how much we think we don't stack up today, guess what? God is working to bring us back to where he wants us to be. The sort of perfect relationship we had with him in the beginning. We have that when we connect with God. We may not be perfect now, but the idea is that God will help us to live good lives, to bear the fruit of the Spirit. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a process that goes on for years and years and decades and decades. It all boils down to that final key point of the gospel, that when people believe in Jesus, they become children of God with purpose. Well, as we wrap up today, I have a homework assignment for you again. You know, if you've believed in Jesus, God calls you his child. He has forgiven you. He has set you apart for a special purpose. One of those purposes is to live a godly life, the sort of life that honors the one who took your place and my place on the cross. So what I want you to do, first assignment, is to come up with one or two words to describe the kind of good life that you think God wants his children to live after they've grabbed onto his hands. You can think of the fruit of the Spirit. What does that look like? What does that mean in your daily life? Once you have grabbed onto God's hand, he gives you a new life, a new community, a new mission, and a new destination. So, secondly, second challenge, is I want you to come up with one or two words or phrases 
to describe what might be part of your new mission. For example, you might say it's preaching the gospel. You might say that it is singing to the Lord. You might say that it's helping to feed the hungry or something like that. Then you can send your words to us through messenger or through email at prayer at fbc-portland.org. Well, I'd like us to close our time with a word of prayer and then we will continue our worship through music. God, we are so grateful that you have brought us here to this point. Dear God, we are grateful that your story involves a rescue mission, quite honestly, Lord. We were in such a wonderful place, Lord. You created us for a relationship with the God who loves us, with yourself, dear God. And yet, Lord, we turned our backs on you. And Lord, that wasn't just a one-time thing that happened so long ago that nobody can fully remember it unless they look at Genesis chapter 3. Lord, that is a reality that we human beings repeat every single day. Lord, we recognize that our world is fallen. Our world is broken. It is imperfect. To say otherwise would be to ignore reality. But Lord, the more important reality is that you saw this situation and you did something about it. When we could not get back to you on our own, you came to us. You died on the cross for us. You rose again on the third day for us. You were victorious over sin and death once and for all. And Lord, you call us into a relationship with you. You don't want to leave us on our own. And so you reach out your hand to us that we might take that hand so that we might know for sure we're not alone, so that we might know that the God of all creation never wants to let us go. You love us that much. You love us, Lord, like the father loved and welcomed home the prodigal son. And you love us even more than that because you don't want to just leave it at that one-time connection but you want to walk with us through daily life, the good times, the bad, the exciting times, and the mundane. Lord, you are with us all the time, challenging us and helping us to grow because you created each one of us for a reason and for a purpose. Lord, I pray that as we reflect on these truths, you would help us to know, first of all, that we are loved, secondly, that we are valued, and third, that there is a future and that there is a purpose for each one of us. God, you are so great, and we love you because of the gospel and what it means for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm so glad that you were able to join us today. And I just want to conclude our time by inviting you, if you have questions about the gospel, about God's story, and how it relates to your story, reach out to us. Just contact us through Messenger or through 
prayer at fbc-portland.org. We would love to talk with you about what it means to follow Jesus. We would love to talk with you about getting baptized or joining this church or just pray for you in general if there's something that's on your mind or that's on your heart. And I want to challenge you as well. If you feel that God has a purpose for your life and you're trying to explore what that might be, even during this crazy time, I think God still has a purpose for all of us. Amen? And so I would invite you also to, to reach out to us as, so that we can work together to help you as you pursue whatever your calling might be in life as well. May God bless you. Thank you again for joining us. Take care.